Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to speak on this bill in, in support of the bill and just reaffirm um, this government's commitment, strong commitment to public transport, and particularly rail transport. Uh, members may recall uh, we electrified the, the southern line. Uh, so in, last time we were in government, uh, we initiated the electrification of the northern line to Gawler when we were in government. It was, it was, yes, it was, um, I was going to say it was completed by the Liberal government. It wasn't actually. It was actually completed during the period of a Labor government again because the Liberal government took so long to get the act together. And apart from the, um, I think it was a delay about 18 months and over budget by hundreds of millions of dollars, they did a pretty good job. Uh, so, but I'm glad that the, um, Electrified, uh, we have electrified trains to Gawler. It's well received. Sadly, not enough people are using the trains yet. Again, um, yeah, yeah. I, I use it regularly, um, and it's important that we actually get more people on rail and on public transport because actually it actually improves safety, road safety, by having more people in public transport and more people, uh, and particularly on rail, because that's the main form of public transport in Gawler is rail. Uh, we have a local bus service but we do not have a publicly funded um, uh, bus service which actually connects Scholar to the other parts of, of Adelaide. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's, uh, uh, to talk about rail, and I think the importance of rail, because um, the, it is important that we uh, need to understand why people use public transport, and particularly rail, and why, what may actually dissuade them from using it, uh, to make sure that we get enough people using rail, because um, I think Rail safety, road safety are, you know, um, are related, and we need to get more people, as I said, on, onto the rail system. In, interesting, when you talk to people, what issues come up about rail? Some, people, some older people talk about their concern about their personal safety on, on rail. Um, I've been using the rail system since 1978, which probably dates me a bit. Um, it's 1970, I've been very, very fortunate and never had any incidents. Um, there's some, you know, I've observed some perhaps poor behaviour, I've observed some whole range of things, but I've never actually um, thought I was uh, unsafe, with, with perhaps one exception back in 1970, might have been 1978, when I was a student at university and I took the 1135 train home. Um, I probably wouldn't do that again. Uh, when I was as an 18-year-old and on the train that night, and um, it was interesting clientele on the train that time of night, people who perhaps uh, sleep different hours than the hours I sleep. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I've been very happy with the train service and the new trains and the new electri electri electrified trains are really good um, and well received. The other issue though, which is an important factor, uh, which determines whether people use rail, particularly rail more so than buses, is timetables. And we need to uh, and I'm, I'm aware that the, this government will review the timetables once we have the full electri electrified stock for, for the service to Gawler. And I am certainly will be working with my community to make sure that we get a time time timetable, uh, train timetable, sorry, which, is, uh, which reflects the needs of people in Gawler and in my electorate, particularly the, uh, which cover the um, train stations of uh, Gawler Central, Gawler Oval, Gawler, um, Evans, the race course on race day, uh, Evanston, Tambourine, Cutler, which is a train station I used to go as a student, which is in my, where I live, and also then, of course, Manapara. Smithwood's not in my, in my electorate, but it serves, serves quite a bit of my electorate because it's a priority train station, and Tambourine, and sorry, and Manapara isn't, even though Manapara has got a, a $13.5 million uh, train station. Uh, not quite used as much as it should be, and that's an important factor when I've been talking about time, train timetables, because those stations, uh, which are priority stations, obviously get more patronage, and that makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, those stations are not necessarily the ones which have the best infrastructure, and we do need to yeah, we need do need to actually match up what the infrastructure is available and to reduce the the. Uh, the need for additional infrastructure, and I, I'll give examples, would be, for example, Smithfield and Gawler stations, probably the uh, other two stations which have priority stations, and um, when we get back to normal levels, the car parks are full. By nine o'clock, they are chock-a-block, 
and that it's very hard to and people didn't start parking in side streets, etc., uh, cause nuisance. So those two stations at some point would need some additional infrastructure. My view would be that if we actually made a couple of other stations, priority stations where the infrastructure exists, um, rather than be empty car parks, we could actually use those. So I'm hoping that the investment we're making at Tambling and Tambling Railway Station, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Acting Speaker, I, I should mention is uh, talk about safety is the safety of people getting to the train station, getting on the train is is actually an election commitment we made. Um, and there was actually an election commitment we made in 2018. Unfortunately, we didn't win that election. Um, the Liberal government did nothing at Tambin Railway Station to improve it. Uh, we've made, I made that same election commitment this time. We did win the election this time. So uh, our government is now delivering on that election commitment. And that commitment, Mr. S Mr. Uh, Acting Speaker, has been fully assessed and by the community. The commitment was made very publicly. Uh, and is one which is supported by the community at large, and I get regular letters and correspondence from people in that area saying, when is the car park and the uh, kiss and drop-off zone uh, going to be built? So we will do that, because I think um, public transport has to be accessible, which leads to my third point about making sure that we have uh, a, a safe rail system, is that uh, it has to be accessible to all people. And Mr. Mr. Mr Acting Speaker, uh, we are improving the infrastructure and Tambling Station is one where we had a number of complaints about people in, with gophers and other mobility aids have found it very difficult to actually access and also the quality of the infrastructure at the station uh, was pretty poor and it took quite a, bit of, quite a while to convince uh, the government of the day, uh, the, Liberal, the Liberal government, to actually improve the, the actual infrastructure on that station. It has been done and certainly the people appreciate the additional services there. Uh, the other thing about rail safety is rail safety, rail safety is obviously uh, making sure that people um, can see the crossings quite well. And we do have an issue with some rail crossings where unfortunately during peak hour traffic uh, and the way the, the roads are aligned, uh, you do have the, the actual afternoon sun <laughs> right in front of you or the morning sun right in front of you and does actually does cause some, some issues but, um, but we actually have, have improved the signalling at those stations and those roads to improve ro rail safety. Mr. Mr. Uh, speak, Mr Acting Speaker, one of the other things about uh, trains is the demand for trains. Um, we have a whole range of people in our community who are train enthusiasts. Uh, I get regular correspondence from some train enthusiasts uh, and they're very keen to know uh, about the government's commitment, which I have no doubt will be honoured, the government's commitment to undertake a full feasibility study of extending, perhaps, or starting up some sort of, uh, or no, I should rephrase that, uh, undertaking a full feasibility to, under, to see whether a tourism-type train can actually operate from Gawler into the Brossa. Uh, my, my discussions with the department indicate that um, the money has been uh, allocated for that project uh, and that, that they're likely to get an, external an independent external consultant to work uh, on that project uh, with a range of people from the Brossa people actually acting as a steering committee. Now, Mr Speaker, it's interesting because uh, it's interesting that people in the Brossa think this is a good idea. Um, unfortunately, the elected members to this place don't think it's a good idea, but also, everybody else seems to think it's a good idea. But I think the previous Minister for Transport, also the Minister for, sorry, the Member for Schubert, did his best to actually um, put enough barriers on that, on that line that, uh, to ensure that perhaps a tourism train will never eventuate it. And I think, I think in part was his, his, his dispute he had with a particular owner of a winery in that area which carried forward, uh, which, is, which is really sad, because at one stage they were going to actually do some repairs for, to one bridge for road safety reasons, just outside Lindock, and the repairs to the bridge or the, the reconstruction of the new bridge would actually mean this, the line would actually be cut off there. If that happened, it would actually kill off the project. I'm happy to say that uh, I'm advised by the department now the revised plans will keep that line intact. And so from Gawler to Tananda initially, and perhaps one day from Gawler to to uh, New Europe, we will actually 
have, have a tourism type trains. The biggest beneficiaries of this investigation into that feasibility of the viability of this proposed train service for tourists, um, Mr Acting Speaker, would be actually the people of the Southern Bross area. Um, they're very supportive of this. Uh, and at uh, the Southern Brosser, which is actually the regional Brosser, where the Brosser actually in it was started, and the regional Brosser Council um, have, with, within, with the um, construction of Gomersal Road and also the upgrading of the Sturt Highway, do sometimes get missed out from tourists. They tend to bypass the southern part of the Brosser, and so they are very keen to see this um, possible piece of tourism infrastructure uh, completed. Uh, we have made it very clear, though, Mr Acting Speaker, that as a government, we, while we support the feasibility, it's not going to be a proposal which will be funded by the government. It, have to be, it has to work. The private sector has to make it work. And our, our role is to, to help the private sector work out what needs to be done uh, and also what needs to be done with terms of the people who actually now actually have the lease over the line at the moment. Uh, I think it's called One Rail these days. Oh, my, 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 I think it's still called One Rail. They've changed their names a number of times in the time I've been in, in this place. Um, that we need to negotiate also lease arrangements. So that would that tourism train could be, actually bring enormous benefits to the southern uh, to the Brossa, and a number of rail enthusiasts have actually made drawn to my attention the success of such trains in not only overseas but also in the eastern states. There's a, there's a number of, of um, trains which do, which actually do rain quite profitably for tourism purposes. Some, some suggestions have been made for the possibility of extending that line for uh, the transport of goods um, out of the Brossa to, to the port. I'm not sure the feasibility of doing that, but certainly there are a number of people in the Brossa thinking ahead in terms of decarbonising the, the component part of, the, of their product. And with Europe, which is a major market, with the, Euro, the European market um, imposing a whole range of new conditions about, uh, about uh, carbon, et cetera, the carbon footprint, uh, we need to make sure that our industry is able to make sure that the forefront of reforms and can deliver their products in a more re uh, carbon reduced manner because, or else we will, we will actually not have entry to some of the markets. Uh, Mr Speaker, as you can tell from the comments I've made, that I'm a quite great supporter of, of rail in this state, uh, not only great support of rail in this state, but also uh, the benefits of rail, uh, particularly uh, not only as tourism as expected, but also as a, as a passenger service. Uh, it was interesting that um, uh, when the, the, the Gawler line was closed down for the reconstruction and electrification, uh, the amount of uh, traffic on our roads did increase at the northern end on our roads. And uh, and sadly, though, um, not everybody has returned to the train stations. They were down for so long, people found alternative ways um, of getting to Adelaide. And I'm sad to say that actually the, the Northern Connector works that well, that people now see it as a, a viable alternative to using rail, except if you have to pay um, um, petrol prices and are helping to put people back on the trains as well. Uh, if you own a car, and you have to pay the petrol bill every week. Uh, rail is a very convenient substitute and a very um, useful substitute. Uh, Mr. S Mr. S Speaker, in terms of the, um, the bill before us, uh, the, the Rail Safety National Law, South Australian Min Miscellaneous Amendment Bill, uh, is, is about rail safety and it's part, uh, it's part of our national laws. Uh, we are uh, moving more to national laws, uh, which, is, which makes good sense because uh, we are one nation and we should have as many possible consistent laws across state boundaries as possible. Uh, and that was certainly envisaged in the constitution too, where the, um, you weren't supposed to put up barriers between trade between states, which, so that was acknowledged that there should be as less possible uh, barriers between the states. The first group of amendments in this bill, uh, Mr uh, Acting Speaker, uh, making an offence for a rail safety worker to knowingly provide a documentable information for the purpose of an assessment of the worker's competency, which is false or misleading, 
or that omits something which, without which the document or information is misleading. Uh, I think that's a, it makes a lot of sense to make sure that we have people working in the sector who are appropriately qualified to do the work. Uh, the repercussions of having somebody who's not properly qualified can be quite serious. And as an aside, Mr. Mr. Acting Speaker, uh, which, and I had this case recently, is that, and I won't particularly mention the industry or identify the person, is that um, with a lot of the training being privatised and put in RTOs, etc., um, it would be fair to say some of the quality and consistency of the training nationally is, is, is subject to, I think, review. I had an example where a, a person who undertook a particular professional qualification interstate, uh, he, he undertook the course in the interstate RTO. Uh, he then obviously submitted his uh, certificate of, of competency, or his, his, his certificate three or diploma, I can't remember what it was, from that RTO, submitted to get his registration to work in that profession, and that's licensed under South Australian law. Uh, he had great difficulty to actually get in his professional, uh, professional licence. And um, in the end, after some to and fro, and he did so, but the South Australian agency was reluctant to actually pr provide this person with the uh, necessary documentation to get this person's licence because he had concerns about the RTO. Now, that is a worry if we have people paying good dollars to, to actually obtain the necessary, necessary training qualifications and competencies if they are then, uh, if, the, if the quality is not up to scratch, uh, are then denied an opportunity to work in that profession they've trained for. So um, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that the new federal government, uh, it, with its commitment to TAFE, uh, in its commitment to lift, lift the skills and training standards in this country, as this government is as well, the, the state Labor government is, will actually iron out those problems and ensure we have a much better resourced TAFE system, but also a better resourced and consistent vocational education system across the country. But I'll go back, I'll get back on track, Mr. Uh, if you excuse the pun, Mr. Acting Speaker. Uh, the bill also amends the national law to provide the National Rail Safety Regulator with a new power to exempt all rail transport operators from Section 140 of the national law in the event of the emergency. And I think that's imp it's important in case you have an emergency. It's a case of all hands on deck, and you need to do, in, and somebody needs to take control of, sorry? On board, on board. yes, steaming ahead. Uh, Mr. Mr Acting Speaker, so section 140 in the national re of the national law requires a, tra a rail transport operator to prepare and implement a health and fitness program for rail safety workers who carry out rail safety work for the operator. Now, there are some, there are some risks in doing that, but I think, I think the risks are less so um, compared to if you don't act in an emergency situation. The bill was, uh, Mr uh, Acting Speaker, was, the bill was developed in, in consultation with the National Transport Commission, all states and territories. The Office of the National Rail Safety Regulator and members of the rail industry, including the Australasian Rail Association and the Rail, Tram and Bus Union. Now, Mr Speaker, this provides an excellent example of what you can achieve when you consult relevant parties to achieve national reform or any major reform. And earlier today, uh, this House passed a bill which, again, was a major reform, the Shop Trading Hours Bill, and that was achieved because the government of the day, the Labor government, consulted with all the parties. We got people on board. Uh, on board. Uh, and so if you consult people rather than undertaking, undertaking unilateral actions, which the former Treasurer did in relation to shop trading hours, where it actually just provided all these exemptions willy-nilly um, and nobody knew where they stood. By working with the relevant parties, you actually get good laws and everybody knows where they stand. Mr Acting Speaker, uh, uh, in relation to the new offence provision, a rail safety worker is re relevantly defined as, as an individual who has carried out, is carrying out or is about to carry out rail safety work. Rail safety work includes driving or dispatching rolling stock, such as a train or tram, or any other activity which is capable of controlling or affecting the movement of rolling stock, coupling or uncoupling rolling stock, work, work involved 
involve, sorry, work involving the development, management or monitoring of safe working sy systems for railways and work involving the management or monitoring of safety, passenger safety on or any other railway. So the role issue of passenger safety, Mr Acting Speaker, is very important. For those, with those comments, Mr Acting Speaker, and for those reasons I've outlined, I think this is a bill worthy of our support. A comprehensive and wide-ranging contribution from the member for Light. The member for Waite. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise today in support of this bill, 